All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Not good morning, my goodness. Good afternoon. Uh, we are going to go ahead and finish up uh, our vector component form. So uh, we are still in 6.3, but today we're going to talk about uh, a slightly different way of doing component forms that is going to be uh, more useful. Okay. Uh, so let's go here and close this. So let's take a look at this and see what we're going to be doing. So uh, like the title says here, we're doing 6.3 day two. Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, uh, so what we're going to be talking about. So yesterday, oops, turned it back on. So yesterday we talked about component form of vectors. So for example, if I have a vector V, right? We talked about uh, how that can be written in component form as V sub X and uh, V sub Y, okay? But there actually, it turns out there's a much better way of doing components, right? So when we take a look at this, we take a look at the X and Y axes but what's gonna be a much better way of doing things is taking a look at three dimensionals. And so three dimensions kind of looks like, like this. So the way that, uh, that you guys will learn this in other dimensions is this will be I, this will be, oops, not capital, J and then um, Z. Um, sometimes they use K, but they shouldn't. Okay, so when we get into three-dimensional stuff, this is what it's going to start looking like. So we have I, J, and Z. So rather than doing uh, X and Y, because X and Y kind of have like a lot of connotation and baggage that come with them, what we'll do instead is we'll have um, vector V uh, will be like... Um, so instead of saying three, four, vector V will be three I plus four J. Okay. So that's what we're going to be talking about, uh, talking about today. So, um, now because of our shortening of the amount of time that we have together, we can't really go too much into I and J, but basically I and J represent one, one unit in that direction. So, so um, and if you guys have time in the book, there is a little blurb about unit vectors. Uh, we just don't have time to go into that today, but basically a unit vector has to do with the magnitude, right? So you have the amount and then in the direction of I and J. So it's, it's uh, what it does is it creates a way of measuring. So you can say, oh, we're going three units in this direction, I, and then you can change what a unit is, right? So like sometimes we say a unit is a foot or a unit is a meter, but having a unit vector allows us to pick whatever unit we want. Right, so we don't have time to go over that today. It is in your book if you want to spend some time going over it. Uh, it is referenced if you go on to take uh, uh, math in uh, community college or college. So not terrible, uh, bad information, but this is what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna be breaking up component form into more of a, a fluid equation form, okay? So, um, Okay, so that's all that I wanted to point out there. So we're gonna be using I and J form. Uh, there is no like definition of I or J. Just know that the I is gonna be mapped onto the X axis and the J is gonna be mapped out into the Y axis. Okay. So that's what I and J for. And anytime you guys are doing like multi-dimensional analysis, this is what's gonna be used, I, J, and Z, okay? And then that way there's no, there's no confusion about input or output, right? Because you can have coordinates 
on in a dimension without it being an input and output. So does that kind of make sense, guys? So like I and J aren't variables like X and Y are. Does, does that make sense? Do you guys see the need for I and J instead of X and Y? Because right, X and Y are variables where I just represents a directional that you pick, right? And then J is just a, a 90 degree of, of this as well. And so what we what you can see that we're leading into is now we're gonna get angles into this, right? So if you define I and J and Z to be perpendicular to each other, then, right, think perpendicular, that's 90, right? So that means we can use right triangles then, which means we can use trig, right? So by doing this, by defining I, J, and Z as being perpendicular to each other, now we open the door for right triangles and trigonometry, and then we can do angles. So that's really the genius behind the system, okay? Which is kind of cool if you think about it, right? Like, you ever wonder why Y and X are perpendicular? Like, because it makes everything so nice. All right, so that's what we're gonna be doing. So I just wanna go ahead and, um, like, we can we can break this down. So for example, uh, instead of component form, right, we're using I and J form. So let's say U, vector U, is negative three I plus eight J, and vector V is two I minus J, right? So we can find two vector U minus three vector V, okay? And this, this is really easy to do. So to do this, right? So first we're gonna need two times uh, negative three I plus eight J, and then we're going to minus three, two I minus J. And what this does is that it's it's a lot more fluid and it's a lot more algebraic rather than set notation, right? With the set notation, it feels weird doing algebra with it, but this now is much easier, right? So multiply everything by two, multiply everything by negative three. So what do we get here? We get negative six I plus um, 16 j minus 6i plus 3j. So I end up getting negative 12i and plus 19j. Okay, which can write is your resultant vector, which is you can write in component form like this. Okay, so those are the same, those are the same answer. How are you guys doing so far? Does this make sense? Are we, are we doing okay with this? So again, instead of component form, uh, there really isn't a name for I and J form. Uh, I, uh, sometimes I've heard it called dimensional form. Um, I kind of like dimensional form, but it's also called uh, unit vector form. It's, it's called I and J form. There's probably an official name for it, but if I don't know it off the top of my head, you're probably gonna be fine until you need to know it, right? And then you can look it up. All right, so let's go ahead and do a couple of practice problems with this, and then we'll see. Oh, so um, like I said, and like what I was trying to, to do before, so having everything perpendicular is gonna set up angles, right? So if I and uh, J are perpendicular to each other, right? So the key here is like, this is perpendicular, this is perpendicular, right, like that. So they're all perpendicular to each other. So that's gonna set up triangles, right? So if you have a point here and a point here, right, that's a triangle. Or if you have a point here and a point here, right, that's a triangle. Or a point here and a point here, that's a triangle. Ooh, and then you can create triangles between the spaces, but let's not get too wild, right? Because you can take a look at all these individual right triangles but then you can also take a look at um, this, this triangle that's colored, right? And you see how that is shaded in there, right? So then how do you do, like how do you do three dimensional, right? But that's not what we're gonna do in our class, okay? But what we do need to know is, is that angles now are on the, are on the plate. So let's take into account, let's, let's take a look into this, how we do directional angles.
Okay, so because everything is perpendicular, this is going to allow us to do trig, right? And I love trigonometry, right? So, um, so basically, so we're going to, right, if we had a vector u, right, and we had defined that as components, x and y components, okay, then we're going to start writing this as cosine of theta i and sine of theta j. Now in now I'm I'm already looking at the graph. Okay. So just don't worry about the shaded part, right? The, to get that shaded part, all I did was made uh, right triangles with each dimension, right? So that's all we need to know right now. But this is actually really easy. So it's it's just um, uh, if if I mean if you think about it, you just find the magnitude of each side, right? Just find the magnitude of each side, and then you have the distance of all sides, and then you do law of cosines. So it's not too bad. Okay. So three dimensional is actually pretty easy. Uh, it just is a little bit more work, which is why when you can, uh, right? So do you see how this is still a, uh, a two dimensional thing, right? It only gets really confusing when you get uh, curves and then you can do calculus with it and it's really easy. Like calculus makes shapes really easy, okay? Which is why we needed calculus, okay? So, uh, so right now, so don't be confused. We're not gonna be doing that. Okay, there's no need to be confused there. So basically, we're going to have cosine of i. Now, think about this, right? So cosine of, of theta, right? There's certain angles, right, that will make these uh, work. Now, and, and this is kind of brilliant, right? So if you have, so let's say it's zero. Well, cosine of zero is one. So you have one i, and then sine of zero is zero. So at zero degrees, you're just at i. So if we take a look at our picture again, Right, so here's this. So if we're angled here, if we're at zero, we're all on I. And if we're at 90, we're all on J. Do you guys see how that works? So it gives us, right, so basically what we're doing is we're rotating, right, our angle like this, okay? So as we change our angle, right, if we start out, we're all on I, and then we go all on J, and then combinations, okay? So that's what we're gonna be doing here. Uh, with that. Now, a couple of things on your homework. So we're going to talk about this tomorrow. So on WebAssign, you can't just type I and J. Okay. So on WebAssign, you can't just type I and J. You have to use math type. Okay, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. So tomorrow when we're going over this, you can't just use your keyboard to type I or J, I and J, which is, for, I mean, that's a minor thing for how good the software actually is. There's a lot of programs that are a lot worse, but you can't use their I and their J. You have to use the math type tool because technically it's like a, 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 a bolded, slightly italic I and J. Okay, so just warning you guys now. Okay. Uh, some other things that we need to know uh, that we need to think about here. Um, uh, I don't need to, to do the unit vectors, so that's good. Okay, so there's a couple of different things we're going to do with this. We're going to have to, given a vector, find the direction, and then given uh, and then to do that. So let's do that first. Okay, and if you guys have questions, I hope you'd let me know. So let's let's do this. So finding directional angle. Okay, so let's do uh, let's do two of these. Let's do so u equals three i plus three j. 
So the, the brilliant part about using I or J uh, is that the angle is hidden. So the angle is hidden in here. And that's what's really cool. So by defining I and J as being 90 degrees to each other, uh, the angle is just hidden. And I'll show you what I mean. So if we were to graph this, right? So we have I and we have J. Okay, so three, three. So that's one, two, three, one, two, three. So then that's gonna be right here. So it's from my origin to here. Okay, so this one, I mean, you guys could probably guess what this is, right? Because it's equal amounts on both, okay? Well, what that does is that you have 3i and you have 3j, right? And this is a 90 degree angle, okay? And so we can use trigonometry to find theta. Okay, just like we can use Pythagorean theorem to find the magnitude, right? So do you guys remember that? So the magnitude of u would equal the square root of 3 squared plus 3 squared, right? And then theta, right? So I'm going to show my work because if I don't show my work, people are going to get upset. But if I do, uh, this is tangent. Right? So that means theta would be tangent inverse of 3 over 3. Okay, and uh, if you guys don't know, tan uh, theta over 3 over 3, that's uh, pi over 4 or 45 degrees. Now, unfortunately, for some silly reason, uh, this book teaches vectors through the eyes of um, engineers. So every, so uh, for, our, for this unit, it's gonna switch back to degrees. So when you guys are using your calculators, make sure you guys switch back to degrees. It's slightly irritating because, <laughs> slightly irritating, it's really irritating because we're always switching between radians and degrees. So from a physics standpoint, we would have to do uh, we would do radians, right? But from an engineering standpoint, you would use degrees, okay? Because just like engineering, uh, engineering jobs, uh, degrees are made up. <laughs> you know what? If you think degrees are better, then you would really like gradients, right? Because if you're gonna make up, if you're gonna make up numbers, then why not have ninety degrees be a hundred? Makes most really basic math a lot easier. A gradient so like 90 degrees is totally made up so instead of 90 degrees why don't we call it 100 degrees and so that you know how, you know the exact percentage that your angle is, is of, a, of a 90 degree angle so if you're just dealing with acute angles gradients is the way to go and then it and then like a circle makes a lot more sense like a gradient there's 400 de 100 degrees in a circle that's cool uh yeah we do have to use i and j so, uh, and it is an issue with dyslexia, and I'm really sorry about that. It, like, it really is. It truly is, and it, it, it's difficult, and we're just going to have to find a way to persevere. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, I do try to do the tails, right? The tail, It's just like, is it face, left or face? But yeah, that's what math does. Um, yeah. Okay. So then uh, I'm going to have you guys try one on your own then. So I want you guys to try this one out. Oh, uh, so uh, by the way, so um, um, yeah. Sorry, I'm just introducing you to this. I was about to say like we should actually start doing useful stuff, but let's uh, let's. So um, so I want you guys to find the directional angle for this one. So here I'll give you a, I'll give you a little bit of time to do that.
All right, so let's go over this. So again, these ones are pretty basic because we're not including the angle into the coordinates yet. So again, we're gonna have a vector. Oops, maybe it's better if I, I start out with. So we have three i, and then it's a negative four j, so we're gonna be going down. Okay, so if I look, that means my vector is going like this. Okay, and then the, the reference angle is always gonna be to the, right, to the uh, origin. So if I'm gonna solve this, this is gonna be tangent of theta equals negative four over three. So theta would equal tangent inverse of negative four thirds. So if I go to solve this, I'm gonna have inverse tangent of negative four divided by three. So my answer, now it gives me a negative answer. So this is where things get really tricky, right? So it gives theta is approximately negative 53.13, but we have to remember that's not how we do angles, right? So this angle, right, they're coming down like this. But that's not how we do angles. We do angles and we go <coughs> counterclockwise. So how do we do that? Well, instead of going this way, we're going to do 360 um, minus 53.13, right? So I'm going to go 360 um Adding a negative is the same as subtracting. And I get that the angle I do want, this angle right here, so if I call that phi, my phi angle equals 306.87 degrees. So we have to be really careful there and know which quadrant you're in, okay? And I bet I, I, I messed up a lot of you guys up there. Sorry about that. I didn't, I mean, I did kind of do that on purpose, but. So notice how this angle right here, right? It's in the fourth quadrant. So it's negative 53.13, but that's how we, not how we do angles. We always do angles counterclockwise from zero. So my phi here would be 306.87 degrees. Okay, and this is the angle that we need. And if you don't do this, you're gonna get the wrong answer, okay? So again, for trig, right, trig is defined as being, we start at zero and zero is due east and we go counterclockwise. How are people doing with that? You guys okay with that? Anybody have questions? Do you guys get that we need to go counterclockwise and so we want this angle and not this angle down right there? So that's gonna be part of what we're working on tomorrow, right? If I give you component form, can you find the directional angle? Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at uh, a next example. So the next example is given a vector, find component form. Okay, so given a vector, we're going to find a, the component form. Have a great day. Okay, so let's say let's say we have a boat. So let's say I have a boat. Oh my gosh, my boat is terrible. There's my boat. Okay, and let's say we have our boat and the boat is, um, let's say the boat is traveling 
at 15 knots uh, that way and at an angle of 20 degrees. Okay. Okay, so we have we have that picture. So 15 knots. Okay. Um, so we want to find um, we want to find V. So find V in component form. So let's do this. Will Sharkberg return? No one knows. Right? Maybe maybe Sharkberg is the reason why. Oh my gosh, Sharkberg. What has happened to your face? <laughs> now it looks like narwhal. Oh my gosh, Sharkberg, what happened? I don't I don't know what I just drew. I think Sharkberg just died. I I don't know what this is. <laughs> This is why I could never do cartoons. I'm not consistent enough. All right. Uh, that looks like Narwhal Sharkberg. Sharkberg's cousin. Uh, Narwhal Sharkberg. All right. So how are we going to do this? Well, to get this into component form, we have to remember that um, the bottom here, right, is our I. And we're going to have a J component as well. Okay, so we're gonna to wanna to break this up into that component form. So to do this, it's actually not too bad. Okay, so we have to remember that um, V is going to be V, the, abs the, the magnitude of V times cosine of theta I plus V magnitude of sine of theta j. Okay, so the component form is always going to be in the magnitude times cosine, right? So think about that. It's your magnitude times what angle, right? So in this case, we know our magnitude, right? Our magnitude is given to us, it's 15 knots. So, for example, if I take a look here, we're going to have, right, 15, 15 knots, and then cosine of 20 degrees I, and then we're going to have 15 knots sine of 20 degrees J. I mean, I mean, that's kind of dark, right? Like Sharkberg got speared by someone on the boat. Now we're getting into like, we're getting into Moby Dick level uh, of drama here. I just, it's hard for me to bring characters back, guys. It's hard for me to bring characters back because I'm not consistent yet with my drawings. Okay, so how are we doing with this? We doing okay there, guys? You guys see how that works? So now we're going to use the magic of technology, right? Which brings us all together. So I'm gonna go 15 cosine of 20 degrees. So I'm gonna get, and it's okay. So I'm gonna just go like this. So, right, so my, X component is going to be about 14.095 I and then my Y component is going to be 15 sine of 20 and so I get my Y component is about 5.130 J okay and so now right given the magnitude and a direction we found component form 
Okay, so if we were to write this truly in component form, we would write this as 14.095 comma 5.130, boom. Okay, does anybody have questions about that? Yeah, the I and the J are just there. They're just there. It's like an information piece. They don't have they don't have value. All right, so this is pretty straightforward, but it gets more complicated. And the only reason this was straightforward, right, is because our angle was in the first quadrant. Okay, our angle was in the first quadrant. Now, what happens when our angle is not in the first quadrant? Well, when our angle is not in the first quadrant, then we have to we have to we have some things that we need to worry about. Okay, so let's take a look. Okay, so let's call this example uh, trace. Okay. So now let's say that Sharkberg is swimming away like this. Okay, because he's like, I don't want to be stabbed anymore with javelins. Okay, so Sharkberg now is going in this direction. Now, this might be 20 degrees here. Okay, so I don't know why I made that so small. So let's say this is 20 degrees from the normal, but we're going in this direction. Okay, and let's say Sharkberg is going, I don't know, pretty fast. Let's say 20 knots. Okay, 20 knots is, how, I, gotta, I gotta look it up, how fast? So 31 miles per hour, two knots. So 26. Okay, so this is this isn't this isn't too bad for a shark. Okay. Okay. So now we have to be really careful. And I would be really mean if I had you guys do this one on your own. So again, we have right the vector of Sharkberg is now going to be um, 20 knots cosine. Now, this is where we have to be really careful. So it's cosine of theta i plus 20 sine of theta j. Now, this is, this is what's really difficult. We have to remember that we define trig to go from zero. So this right here is theta, okay? So that's where people are gonna make heck of mistakes is that they're gonna plug in 20 degrees, but it's not 20 degrees, it's, um, it's theta, okay? So to get theta, right? So it's gonna be 180 degrees plus 20, right? So 180 degrees, does that make sense? So this is 180 degrees, oops. So 180 degrees plus 20 is 200 degrees. A lot of twos here, right? So when I go to write this, I need to write the vector v equals 20, and then I'm going to have cosine of 200 degrees i, and then I'm going to have 20 sine of 200 degrees J. Okay, so the big thing here is right, we don't use we don't use the 20. How are people doing so far with this? You guys doing okay? 
So then I would, so the picture is worth so much because you see, right, you get to see what angle you want. So I'm going to go to do 20 cosine of 200 degrees and I get V equals about negative 18.794I and then 20 sine of 200 is negative 6.840J, right? Or you can write that in complete component form, which is negative 18.794 and negative 6.840, like that. Okay, and then that should make sense, right? Because our I is negative and our J is negative, right? They should both be negative because we're in that third quadrant. All right, guys, I did a couple of examples. You guys ready to try one on your own? Well, let's, let's see, let's see, let's see what you guys can do, okay? Um, okay, so let's get out of shark infested waters for a second. So try this one on your own. So, um, Just a second, problem. All right, there's a problem on your homework and I have to make sure I do something similar to that. Okay. okay. So let's say you have a, a river and a river, okay? And you have a boat. Now the boat's trying to get to the other side. So the boat has a velocity of, um, I'm tired of doing knots. Let's say the boat has a velocity of 20 miles per hour. Okay. But the river, the river is flowing. So the river is flowing at a rate of 10 miles per hour to the right. I want you to find the directional angle and the component form of the resultant. which in this case is the component form of the path of the boat. Okay, do you think, is this enough information? Do you guys feel comfortable doing this on your own? Want to give it a shot? So you're going to find the directional angle of the boat, and then you're going to find the, the, the component form of the resultant, or i.e. the path of the boat. Okay, well, give it a try, guys. Here, I'll give you, um, I'm going to give you guys three minutes to work on it, and we'll see where we go. I'm going to go use the restroom really quickly, and I'll be right back.
All right, guys, are you ready to solve this and break this down? Okay. Well, the solution, now that I added in the person and the bunnies, is there is no solution. The bunnies have already killed your friend. But we can still calculate the path of the boat. So let's do that. So how do we do that? Well, I should have said we can assume that the boat, right, is going due north 20 miles per hour. And then the river perpendicular to the boat is going 10 miles per hour. So the resultant then is the boat is going to go to the right, right? So instead of going straight across, like the boat thought it was, right? The, the bow might be pointed forward, but it's gonna move down the river like this. So if the boat chose to go this way, right? It's not gonna go straight across the river. It's gonna go at an angle like this, right? Cause it's gonna be floating down the river. Okay. So what we need to do is we need to find this angle theta. So what angle it's gonna be going. And we want to find the magnitude V. Okay, pop, pop. So first I'm gonna find magnitude. So the magnitude is gonna be the square root. Remember it's usually plus or minus for square roots, but we're since we're going for a length, we only care about the positive. So I'm only gonna have I'm gonna have 20 squared plus 10 squared. Um, I'm embarrassed that I'm using a calculator for this, but here we are. So 500. Okay, so does anybody have questions how I did that? Again, pop in with, with questions anytime you guys have. So I got uh, the magnitude, right? It's the square root of 500. So then we want to find theta. So theta is gonna be tangent inverse of opposite, so 10 over 20. So that's one half, right? So it's tangent inverse of one half. So I can go like this and I can say, okay, uh, tangent inverse of one half. So it's theta is approximately 26.4. Five six five degrees. Now notice how I use the first quadrant answer because if I'm going this way, I'm going to be in the first quadrant, right? So next class tomorrow, we are going to get problems where it's not going to be in the first quadrant. So maybe if I had the river going to the left, right, this would have been a more difficult problem. But alas, I made it too easy. Okay, so then if I want to write this out in component form, right, so we found our magnitude and we found our degrees. So if I want to write this in component form, I'm going to have, hey, my, the, uh, well, the velocity uh, vector of my moving ship is going to be the square root of 500 times cosine of, and then I might just leave it as an exact value, tangent inverse of 1 half. Um, and then plus the square root of 500 times the sine of tangent inverse of one half, right? So this is my I, this is my J. Sorry, I'll turn off the timer. Okay. So does this make sense with the component part? So then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to type these into my calculator. So I have the square root of 500 and then times sine of tangent inverse of 0.5, okay? And so I get 10, so, right? So this is gonna double check that everything is right. So we should get 10 and we should get 20, right? And then check this out, right? So the square root of 500, I hope this is blowing some of your brains, right? The square root of 500 and then cosine of tangent of 0.5 should be 20. And that's exactly what we had for our components here. So the math works out. And that's really what I was just trying to show you there, right? Once you get your magnitude and your angle, right? The component part pieces right here, notice how it's uh, a positive 10, a positive 20. It's gonna be that. Uh, yeah, I wrote I twice, didn't I? 
Thank you. Okay. So cool. So uh, it comes full circle with this problem just like this. Uh, so whenever you take the square root of a square, right? So if you, uh, so just a reminder of squares, right? So if you take a look at x squared, right? So x squared looks like this. So for one, so if you have an output of four, there's two inputs that give you that, right? So when I go to do the inverse of this, I get this, right? But the blue, right, which is the square root of x, that isn't a function, right? So that's why, uh, do you see how square root of x isn't a function? So that's why when we do the inverse, that's why when we do, so, right, so x squared, so this is down here is negative square root of x. So see how it, so to make it a function, square root of x is just the top and the negative square root of x is the bottom. So that's why when we take, when we have x squared and we take the square root of it, you have to do plus or minus the square root of x because there's two possible answers here, but in the square root of x, there's only one answer, right? Do you see with the square root of x, there's only one answer. So you have to do the plus or minus right there. Okay, so that's why we do that. So what we're gonna be working on tomorrow, guys, is, right, uh, given components, can we find magnitude and direction? And then um, we have to be extremely careful about not using necessarily the angle that is given to us, but using the angle that comes from zero. And that's what's gonna cause us the most headaches, because um, that would be a great question to put on the midterm. Does that make sense? Like that would be, that would be ideal. Okay. So uh, I was going to have us do one more, but we're not going to have time to do one more. So with that said, uh, just really quickly before you guys go, because there is going to be a question that's important for you guys to be able to do. Yeah. So just make sure that you guys can uh, find direction and magnitude, draw a picture, and then we'll be good there. So I think that's good for today. Uh, if you guys want to log off, you guys can. Uh, if you're in campus, you can't leave uh, until the bell rings, but it gives you a couple of minutes to contemplate um, your life and whether or not bunnies uh, actually do have sharp enough teeth to kill you. Bye, guys. Take care. I will see